everybody. And uh, I, I just am looking at the uh, uh, people who are participating and uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, uh, attendance. And I, I saw that Secretary Dunn was on and we have uh, several senators and house members. So uh, across the board, I think that uh, everybody recognizes the uh, importance of uh, this, I guess I'm going to call it a meeting, even though it's virtual and what the way we're doing it, it's uh, we've deliberately made it bipartisan, it's bicameral, and the presentation, as I've uh, publicly said, is an honest conversation about energy, the economy, and the environment. My name uh, is Senator Gene Yaw, and I'm just honored to uh, host this meeting. Um, I think we have about uh, 350 or so, close to that uh, participants today. So I guess that that just goes to show the importance of this issue and, and how important this presentation is. Dr. Tinker is the director of the 250 person Bureau of Economic uh, Geology. Uh, he's the state geologist of Texas and a professor holding uh, the Edwin Alday Endowed Chair at the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, he is the, the founder and chairman of a nonprofit uh, organization called Switch Energy Alliance. And he's co-produced and is featured in the award-winning energy documentary film Switch, which has been screened in over 50 countries to more than 15 million viewers and is used on thousands of K through 12 and college campuses. Uh, he's completed two additional films, Switch On, uh, which is a feature length documentary addressing global energy poverty and energy makes our world, which is a five minute Hollywood quality film made for global museums and giant screens. Uh, in his travels, he's visited some 65 countries and he's given uh, over 850 keynote and individual lectures. So we're really kind of fortunate to have him uh, be with us today. He's recognized internationally and has served as president of several associations, including the American Geosciences Institute, the Association of American State Geologists, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and the Gulf Coast Association of Geological uh, Societies. He's been honored uh, with several awards from these organizations. He works to bring industry, the government, academia, and non-government organizations together to address uh, major societal challenges in energy, the environment, and the economy. Uh, I've watched several of his presentations and frankly, I found them very fascinating and uh, interesting uh, approach to the energy world, which we uh, find ourselves. The way this came about, I, uh, on a personal note, is uh, I had seen one of his presentations and I mentioned it to my staff. You know, boy, it would really be interesting if we could get Dr. Tinker to do a presentation to, uh, the, we started off with the Senate, uh, and which obviously is expanded to uh, the entire legislature. Um, I mentioned that we contacted uh, Dr. Tinker and he was gracious enough to uh, uh, be willing to do this. So uh, as I've indicated with his credentials, we are really fortunate to be able to have somebody like this do a presentation for us. Before we turn uh, this over to Dr. Tinker, I would like to uh, ask my uh, uh, Senate Environmental Committee Minority Chair, Senator Carolyn Kmita, if she would make a few brief opening comments. Senator Kamita. Thank you so much, Chairman Yaw. And um, I wanna thank and welcome uh, Dr. Tinker for being with us here today. 
Um, I so look forward to the presentation and I um, appreciate Senator Yaw for organizing it and bringing us all together, bipartisan and bicameral. Um, I've found that Senator Yaw and I um, agree um, wholeheartedly on the importance of open, honest, and informed conversations on energy, the environment, um, and the economy. Uh, the intersecting issues of climate change, reducing our carbon emissions, developing jobs, investing in a clean energy economy, these are all the most pressing issues of our time. And they raise questions and challenges that are impacting and will impact us today and for generations to come. So the exciting news, there is new research, technology being advanced to develop cleaner solutions to power our world and our daily lives, to better protect our environment and to create tremendous opportunity for career growth and jobs. So um, let's do the hard work together to build that consensus to find common ground that will benefit the future of our planet, our economy, each of us and our children. Um, that conversation, of course, starts by talking and listening. So I look forward to listening to Dr. Tinker today and thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Senator Yaw. Thank you, uh, Senator Kamita. Uh, it's an honor to welcome Dr. Scott Tinker this morning to his presentation to discuss the interrelationship between energy, the economy, and the environment. I know that we've gotten many questions in advance. Uh, they are really important. Uh, I've discussed them a little bit with uh, Dr. Tinker and uh, what he's going to try and do is hopefully preempt in, in his uh, presentation, uh, answer some of the questions. Uh, we may not have time at the end for a, a Q&A, but uh, uh, please understand your questions are important. We uh, will try and accommodate them the best that we can. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for joining us from Austin, Texas, Dr. Tinker. Okay, here we go. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. I gave a talk last week and I was in 10 slides before they told me they couldn't see the slides. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great to be here, uh, chairman, ranking member, uh, senators, house members with you uh, from Pennsylvania. It's really an honor for me. And I appreciate this event bringing as you say, bicameral uh, and also bipartisan, that is the only way issues like this energy are going to be addressed. So I'm I'm not a great fan of the word honest. To be, you know, somebody says I'm going to be honest with you. I go, whoa, whoa I better listen close. You know, maybe we'll call it a candid conversation. But whatever it is, we got to dive in. And you sent me questions around 2:30 yesterday. Here's a few of them, and I thought I'd just answer them individually right, right now. Actually, I've worked some of them in, but. I found these fascinating because I could tell in some cases whether you're on the right or the left or in the middle, and it looks like an American flag when I color them this way, but I will be able to address, I think, many of these that I've highlighted here in yellow, and I rolled some of them up into some overarching questions as well. So what do humans expect from energy? What is global energy poverty? Are some forms of energy clean and others dirty? What drives energy transitions, and is shale going to come back post-COVID? What can actually reduce CO2 emissions in the time frame that's needed? And what is an equitable energy transition? These are some overarching questions and I really hope to address these. So Aristotle said it's a mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And, and I appreciate the fact we're gonna entertain a lot of thoughts today. You might not like everything I say or even agree with it. We all bring our own perspectives and, and experiences to it. But let's entertain those and, and see where we come out. And really, I think what he was describing here is critical thinking, looking at the pros and cons of issues from multiple different directions. And here's an example of 
kind of non-critical thinking, damn it, you know, should have put the boat in the lake first. And we have that happen quite often. So I'm going to start with a figure that would be quite complicated if you were just to look at it, but it's so important. How do we use energy? We heat and cool and light things, residential, commercial, industrial, and we move ourselves around. That's what we do with energy. Now, electricity is growing as an end use for energy and electricity feeds into these different sectors, residential, commercial, and just starting in the transportation. And out of the back end of that, we do useful work and don't worry about the numbers. They're just proportional to the amounts. So we call that energy services or useful work. We also waste a tremendous amount of energy. This is called rejected energy. It's more than half of the energy that goes in doesn't get used. So let's look at it. And my slides are all color coded. So coal is always gonna be gray and coal is mainly for electricity generation. It's used for other things as well, making steel, et cetera. Pretty wide bar there. Some biomass, which is pre-coal, let's call it. It's just carbon today. Uh, and it's used in different sectors, not as much. Oil, petroleum, mostly for transportation, but also industrial and some commercial and residential uses. Quite a lot of it. This is US mix around 2018. We're working on these figures. Uh, for the 2020. Natural gas, very versatile. Okay, it, it goes into all sectors. We make power, heat and cool things, we cook with it, industrial uses, and it's just a little bit in the transportation sector, but growing globally that way. And then there's nuclear. It's one purpose, and you have nuclear in Pennsylvania, certainly, for power generation. Hydro, uh, dams for power, and a little bit else. Wind, dominantly for electricity. Here's solar, and then geothermal. So you can see the different widths and the amounts and where they go. And it's a fascinating figure. It's called the Sankey diagram. These are the thermal forms of energy. These are color coded. Again, they'll always look like this in my figure so you can keep track of them. And then these are the renewables. And they're not as, you know, certainly the width of the bar is not nearly as much, but you're starting to see growth in that sector as well. So what do we want this energy to do? We want it cheap. We want it to be cheap. We want it to be reliable and we want it to be clean. That's a small, that's no small task. You know, I say, boy, that's aspirational. Perhaps we could get things to be all three of those all together. And we're going to talk a lot about that. What does cheap mean? Well, it means price volatility. We certainly know that the price of oil is quite volatile. We've seen West Texas Intermediate and the Brent crude. These are the benchmarks globally. The Great Recession has an impact when demand goes down. So did COVID. Look at the drop in price. It went negative at one point in time on the spot. But did you think about other things, other commodities like copper for wind turbines? It's very volatile in its price. Or how about cobalt for batteries? Very volatile in its price. These are all earth resources. They're all mined from the earth and they're commodities and they're volatility in their pricing. How about affordability? That's another, that's another piece of cheap. And I like to think about the consumer or the customer at the end here. So yes, indeed, the levelized cost of coal has stayed sort of flat. And solar and wind have come below that, which is very powerful. Levelized, you have to know what that means. It's not, you might think completely levelized to the consumer. It's not. It's levelized at the gate. It doesn't include the cost to back up intermittent energy. And that's a big cost. So this is a completely factual statement. It's honest. <laughs> okay. But it's not factually complete. In fact, when you look at it, Certain states pay a lot more for their electricity than others do. And, and the cost of electricity and gasoline and things that everybody has to pay the same for is regressive. So we have to think very hard about this. We think we're dealing with it in Texas now, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So, so why is that? Why are some electricity a lot more expensive than others? So when you think about solar and wind, they're not always there. And you've heard this a thousand times. The sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't blow. That matters, okay? So it requires some backup to be reliable. What, what can we do? We have plants that follow the load. I'll show you some data in Texas. Those cost money. They're, they're not always on. We can, we can store electricity. That is a big scale when you start thinking about it at scale and cost. You can disperse renewables over big areas, but that takes a lot of transmission and other things, a big area of access. Or we can combine different sources and there's a timing issue here. So nothing is simple. Uh, it's all doable, but not simple, and it all costs money. So solar and wind, to make them reliable, they have to have backup. And that's more expensive to the consumer. And this is important to understand. Now, reliable, intermittent, what does that mean? Well, this is, this is a week in Texas in the summer. We use a lot of energy in the middle of the day and air conditioning, and then it goes down at night, et cetera. Here's the wind in Texas. 
and the wind comes and goes. It's mostly in the evening. So when the wind is off cycle with the demand, we see these spikes in the price of, of electricity. Okay, it's, called, it's an energy market here in Texas and ERCOT is the grid. Everybody's heard of ERCOT now. So we see these spikes and they really spike during the big chill. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So that matters. You have to have this uh, balancing demand and supply a portfolio of generation options, just like stocks or, or real estate to be reliable. And then reliability also, is it available? 24-7, 365, can I get it? And at what cost? So you might've heard about the big chill. This is literally looking right out my window. Pretty odd scene here in Texas. And this is, this is the big chill in Texas. The freezing line I've indicated, I put Dallas on. The high in Dallas was normal for a while in the first week of February, then it fell below freezing. The high below freezing and the lows were way below freezing during that week. The energy mix, what did it look like? Well, nuclear and light blue and coal and dark blue, natural gas and green. And here's the wind in orange and a little bit of solar. We don't use as much wind in the sun in the winter because we don't need as much energy, electricity. And the sun is not up as long at short days and low on the horizon, et cetera. It's just not as efficient, but it's still intermittent. The wind comes and goes. So you have to back that up. And we use natural gas to follow that load. So you can see the green following the load of wind and coal even doing some of that too in a normal week. Now, what happened when it got really cold? Here's the data. You've probably read a thousand things on this, but this is the data. Well, for a week, nuclear hung in there and coal hung in there and wind and solar went away quite a bit. Even the part we were calling on, things froze, et cetera, and the panels were covered with snow. So you couldn't get to it as much. Natural gas, day on day on day, just continued to increase. It, in fact, we met the extreme demand forecast peak for the winter in Texas. That was our highest, 67 gigs. We met it on February 14th on Valentine's Day. Natural gas more than doubled in that time period. And then it stayed cold and everything started to collapse. So a, a reactor, nuclear reactor went offline when the cooling pump, coal piles froze and that went down. Solar and wind essentially went away and natural gas from its peak cut quite a bit as well, 30% or more. So it was, you know, you couldn't, the lines were freezing up, you couldn't keep them warm, resources, et cetera. So we started having blackouts and that's when they began and they went for about four days in this way. So you can interpret that however you wish to in that, but, but it matters when, doesn't it? What was working when and then what failed when? And, and the price, you know, I was in the house, uh, our house resources hearing yesterday, we were having them live and talking about all these things down in our own capital. Price went way up and how are you gonna pay for that? One thing that was unlimited was a finger pointing. <laughs> we had a, we had an unlimited supply of finger pointing. If that was energy, we'd be set. But natural gas is the culprit. Solar and wind tanked. It's an isolated grid. ERCOT and planning is the problem. It's an energy market. It should be a capacity market. The equipment wasn't resilient enough. The cost upgrades too much. Climate change drove it all. You know, well, what permanent changes will the big chill cause? And that, this is an event. And it's important to think about how long and, and what should be done. A rigorous cost benefit analysis looking at these issues is needed. Should we make it more resilient for the winter? Perhaps, what will that cost compared to the occasional big freeze? And these are the kinds of questions that need to be asked. And what does clean mean? It means to some CO2 emissions, and that's a very important part of it, particularly these young kids. They're losing their rights to skip school and save the earth, and I admire that. I, I, the fact that you can globally organize is amazing. To them, ESG means C, it means climate. The whole thing is climate to you know, a lot of young people in the world today. But we know there's more to the environment than just CO2 emissions. That's a big part of it, but there's the local air. In fact, when we made our film switch on, took this picture in Nepal, Sanakanchi, cooking indoors with wood and biomass of various kinds. It turns out there's 2.6 billion people in the world today, a third of the world still cooking indoors with wood or dung or charcoal and biomass. It kills 3 million people every single year, just breathing the indoor particulates and other diseases that come along with that. That's more than COVID killed in 2020, every single year. And it's so solvable. And then what about the land and the water, the other big pillars of the environment? I took this picture in Nairobi, in Kibra, the big slum outside of Nairobi. And these kids were coming home from school about, across mounds of garbage, dirty water, dirty soils, dirty air, local air. And again, I've been in 65 countries. Without exception, the worst environments in the world are where it's poor. They just can't afford 
to clean it up. They have other things that they're worrying about. So cheap, reliable, and clean, it's really about cheap is the economy, reliable is about energy, and clean is about the environment, isn't it? So we're really talking about this confluence of energy, the environment, and the economy. And in a big way, we can look at the big issues facing the world today, and I've highlighted several here. And those in orange are largely economic related and related to poverty. And here sits energy, and here's climate change, and some want to paint that as an or. Climate change or the economy, what side are you on? I, I don't think of it that way. I, I put land, air, and water in here as well, and let's call those the environment and energy and the, and the economy. We've got to bring these things together to have a chance to address them all because energy underpins the economy. It allows us the economies to grow. We'll see some data on this. And the economy allows us to invest in the environment, a healthy economy. Again, those countries I visited where the environment is a mess are poor. Affordable, reliable, available energy, poverty, competition, and growth, air, atmosphere, land, and water. It's complicated, isn't it? Social, legal, political systems, they're very interactive. You can't underestimate the complexity of this system, but it doesn't mean it's not solvable. So we come back to these and let's, let's talk about it a little bit politically. I, I tend to stay away from this, but you know, in, in some sense, the developed nations on the left, they're passionate about clean energy. And I, and I take that to mean all of it, land, air, water, and atmosphere. And, and the right tends to be passionate about the economy and reliable energy. And trust me, I know you are all passionate about both of these things. And the emerging and developing economies, they need it cheap. That's what they need today. So here we sit at the confluence of reliable, clean, and cheap. And I call that the radical middle. This is where things are tough. You got to have tough conversations, look at data, but it's where the big issues will get solved. So we start thinking about energy on this figure now, coal and oil, the foundational energies, electricity and transportation, those are the cheap things still for emerging and developing economies, and they will have them. Gas and nuclear are more reliable or dispatchable, baseload, uh, cleaner, and, and then wind and solar on the clean and batteries, maybe electric vehicles and other things. And isn't it interesting when you start putting these around where, where they fall, but I think we all know these have to come together in that radical middle. There's parts of each of them globally for sure that are going to be critical to address this. And each of them have different environmental impacts. Some don't have any emissions. Some are much better on the land and the air and some better on the water or use more water. So when you start thinking about moving energy, that's a huge issue too. Maybe you wanna do it all with electricity and we'll move it as electrons on power lines. It's gonna take a lot of power lines and it has issues then reliability. Molecules are moved with pipelines, gas and liquid molecules. And, and on trains, trucks, and boats, we move molecules and products. A lot of energy is moved as products. It's already been built somewhere else and we just want the thing, the stuff, okay? So moving energy matters too. We come back to this and we say, boy, if I could, if I could bring clean a little more reliable and more affordable, or if I could make reliable a little cleaner, and if I could make the cheap stuff both reliable and clean, now I'm in that radical middle. And again, with work, it's doable. And I'm going to call that equitable energy. This is that overlap space where we're going to have things globally equitable. So what is it? Access to affordable and reliable energy, which underpin a healthy economy and a clean environment. Energy, the economy, and the environment. That's equitable. Well, what's unequitable? What does little to no energy mean? Well, there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who are good at math, those who aren't. So let's do some simple arithmetic. Here's the, the electricity consumption per person in different countries. And we filmed in Ethiopia and Kenya for Switch. Here's my fridge. Just if you don't speak kilowatt hour, my fridge consumes nine times more kilowatt hours than a, an average person in Ethiopia, three times more than a Kenyan. That's, that's energy poverty. And if you look at... Severe poverty across the bottom, $3 a day of income, $1,000 a year against electrification rate of a country. This is Latin America. The size of the circle is proportional to population, Brazil the largest. It's mostly electrified, about 20% plus or minus severe poverty. Asia, a lot more people, less electrified, more poverty. In Africa, another 1.1 billion. You see Kenya and Ethiopia much less electrified and much more severe poverty. Now, correlation isn't causation, we know that, but there's just, 
there's this relationship between getting out of poverty and access to electricity or energy. It presents a paradox. Energy won't end poverty, but you can't end poverty without energy. And I first said this down in Quito, Ecuador, when we just had come back from a severely impoverished village. And, and, and I knew energy wouldn't end it, but they had to have it to begin to start. So it's time to power the people. And, and what does that look like? Well, on a per capita basis, energy per person, North America and Europe, we consume a lot. Now we're coming down, which is good. It's a good trend per person, lower energy consumption. The rest of the world combined is going up, okay, per capita. And, and, and Russia and the Middle East consume a lot, as much as Europe. But look at Asia and Africa and South and Central America. I mean, per capita, not much yet. Interestingly enough, there are about 7.7 .7 billion people in the world today, and over three quarters of them live in Asia, Africa, and South and Central America. Three quarters of the world's population is not consuming much energy. This is a tremendous future challenge for us, and it affects us all. So when you look at global income in the world, where are Africa and Asia and South and Central America? Well, it turns out Africa and Asia are just emerging. 1,000 a year to 4,000 a year, they need cheap energy and they will have it and they are getting it. Now, if you go up to that four to 12,000 a year, more the middle income, some in, in West, Eastern Europe and Russia, but a lot in South and Central America, they need reliable energy. They can count on it to emerge, develop their economies. Now we made this film called Switch On and filmed in these five countries. And I hope you have a chance to see it. It really features some of the great challenges here and the opportunities. Kids in schools are getting two light bulbs. I took these pictures and again in a, in a slum dangling and they're learning, they're learning English, past and present tense for the first time. And they're trying to lift themselves from poverty. They're trying to have to not shave their heads to be able to see the lice that live in them. And, 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 and literally a couple billion people in the world are still in this state. Now the developed nations, 12,000 a year, which isn't that much. Our poverty rate in the US is over $22,000 a year poverty. So globally rich is considered 12,000. We want it clean. And particularly in Western Europe and the United States, we want that energy clean. And there's not, there's not that much blue, is there? Not, not that much wealth in the world today. So when we come back here, what we're really talking about is trying to figure out how to make transitions that are equitable in this 3E space. Energy transitions, they involve energy density and technology and access, wealth and public opinion for sure, the scale and natural events and reliability. There are a lot of things that go into transitions. It is not binary. There is not a good and bad here. There's a lot of things to be considered. So let's take a look <laughs> pictorially. You know, over a thousand years ago, we were warming ourselves with wood and cooking with it. And the sun was growing some biomass of different kinds. In fact, the engines of the day, animals pulled their own food. We used the motion of rivers to grind mill and, and, and the motion of wind to lift water up. And these have been around a long time. We used whale oil to make lighting indoors with lamp oil. And then we got bigger wheels and we call them hydro. Uh, and then engines pulling its own food called coal. And that coal was burned to make steam, local and big amounts of steam. And that allowed us to put in grids and electricity and then along came liquid fuels, okay, hydrocarbons. And they allowed us to put those liquids in cars and planes and a lot of other uses. And then finally methane, the most versatile fuel as you saw in the Sankey diagram and then nuclear, uranium and thorium. So why am I kind of showing you this progression over over a thousand years? Well, as you move from left to right, what you're really seeing is a change in density. The amount of land used to, to create energy or to capture energy. And certain forms of energy are just a lot more dense. It's just physics. You know, they, they win in this case because they are a lot more dense, hundreds of times more dense than other forms of energy. So we call those on the left mostly renewable and these thermal, boil water, make steam, turn a turbine, run a generator. Or we might call them clean and we might call them dirty. It's a little more judgmental. You could flip it politically and call them intermittent and reliable. You know, pick your favorite terms. I'm sure you use them, right? But the fact is here we sit and what we really see is a change from hay and wood and coal and other forms of carbon-based fuels, biomass of different kinds, biofuels, to hydrocarbons, oil, hydrogen and carbon, to CH4, methane, 
one carbon and four hydrogens. Methane is really a hydrogen fuel. And then eventually perhaps pure hydrogen and then uranium and thorium for nuclear reactions, the heat for the nuclear. This is a transition from higher to higher density and lower carbon. It's been happening naturally because of physics for the most part and economics. We are decarbonizing naturally. Now it may not be fast enough. So we come back and say, well, let's build bigger wind turbines and collect the sun again. And there's some sense in that depending on your economy, but it's a challenge. It's lower density and lower carbon. And again, that's not trivial. We can't minimize that. So what do you think of when you think of coal, a high density fuel? You might think of Beijing and the, and the particulates in the air. How about oil, pump jacks and the, and the impact on the environment of oil? Natural gas, Pennsylvania, you know, pipelines and, and a lot of the rest of the world as well. And nuclear, you might think again, you have, I think, five or six reactors and that's steam coming from the cooling towers, but it's a big industrial process. Coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear, these things impact the environment. You mine and manufacture to build the equipment, you drill and complete the wells, you have to handle the water, there's risks there. You move the energy around in a variety of ways, refine it, petrochemicals, and then you burn it. You know, these have environmental impacts. It, they're a lot less in developed nations because of regulations than they are in developing and emerging economies. But there are big impacts here. And, and so you'll, this last week, big tobacco had to pay 206 billion is big oil next. And you know, this is comparing oil to tobacco. It's quite fascinating, I think, because last time I checked, oil has a lot of benefits to the world, including us. And, and you just take all those away when you kind of compare them to cigarettes. Now, maybe you like to smoke, that's up to you. But this is an interesting comparison, isn't it? And it's done with intent. What do you think of when you think of solar? Picture that in your mind. Do you think of this? Do you think of a big polysilicon plant to make the panels? Uh, what about wind? Do you think of this? Do you think of just 100 wind turbine blades cut into thirds? I'll put wind man to scale here and being buried in Wyoming. It's a made, that's a massive tractor. We have 39,000 wind turbine blades in Texas today spinning. This is 100. How about when you think of a Tesla? an electric vehicle. This Colorado thinks of no oil, you know, I guess they don't have tires or plastic or they don't know what's in a car, but I bet they don't think about this. I bet they don't think about a lithium mine. And this is a lithium ion battery in a Tesla S, three inches long, about an inch in diameter. Turns out there are 7,000 of those in one car, 7,000 in one, 7,000 cell phones in one Tesla S. If we were going to electrify the world's vehicle fleet of 1.2 billion vehicles, it would take 8 trillion Tesla S batteries, 8 trillion to electrify the vehicle fleet today. How many is that? What does that look like? Why well, cover the field in lithium ion batteries, Tesla S batteries, solid, no space. It's 2.7 million. They're about an inch in diameter. So I'm going to start stacking them an inch at a time. How many does it take to get to 8 trillion? Well, it turns out you go past Mount Everest and out of the stratosphere, past the mesosphere, you go 50 miles into the air, into the atmosphere to electrify the vehicle fleet. Yeah, for giggles, I'll call that Musk Tower, but you know, we got to do some math here. And the challenge is if you only had to do that once, that'd be maybe okay, but they wear out like your cell phone. You got to do it over and over again. So nothing is without, and, and I hear about recycling and I read a lot about it. And the fact is for lithium ion, we do about 5% of recycling today. And that's with our tens of billions of gadgets, not a trillion, okay? Now, where do those minerals come from? Well, lithium is now controlled, at least on the refined and mine basis by China and cobalt even more so. Getting started with China in nickel and other things. Polysilicon, China now, just from 15 years ago, over half of the polysilicon for the solar panels. And the cobalt mining is not done in good ways like it's done here and most of this mining isn't. So there's human rights issues as well. Energy security, who owns the materials? Are we going to move from OPEC to China for oil to batteries? Human rights issues, these are things that we care about and we have to consider as we, do, as we think about all these options before us. So it turns out that renewable energy, solar and wind and other things have impacts too. We got to mine and process used land for the panels and the turbines and the batteries. We got to make them in large chemical plants and, and transmit the electricity because it like Texas, it doesn't blow where we need it, big power lines. And then it goes into landfills, 
most of it still does. And I'm not picking on solar and wind anymore. I was picking on oil and gas and coal. The reality is humans have environmental impacts and we've got to continue to clean it up. But mining, manufacturing and disposing that process and doing it over and over isn't renewable. And I know that's going to make some of you angry. I'm sorry to say it this way, but but the sun and the wind are, but we have to capture the sun and the wind to do useful things with them. And, and the mining, manufacturing and capture disposal is not a renewable process. It's an earth resource, okay? It's a different kind of clean and dirty, lower emissions, more impact on nature in many ways. So, you know, big tobacco had to pay two, or big renewables next. I call this the author of the future. I hope I never read this article. The sun and the wind and batteries have a huge role to play in our future. They're, they're completely different from cigarettes, just like oil and gas and coal are. They have changed the world for the better, but they have impacts. So we're really talking about transitions. What type? There are event-driven transitions, natural, economic, technological. These are largely unpredictable. There's resource-driven, power density, scale access, the things we've been talking about. And these tend to be sustained when they happen. And then there's policy-driven, your policymakers, public opinion, you're driven by that and energy security. These tend to be sick, depends on who's in the power, doesn't it? So let's look at some of these different kinds globally. Here's Brazil, same color code, oil and green, and, and a lot of hydro in Brazil. That's most of their energy. And here comes uh, renewables, the wind, the sun, and, and the geothermal and biomass. So this is mostly, and there's the CO2 emissions. I'll show you that for each country. They've been growing and growing. They've been flat for about five, six years now because economic trouble in Brazil and consumption goes flat when the economy is flat. You might think of Brazil as the world's leader in biofuels. You'd be right, but scale is so important. This green, that's the total biofuels in Brazil compared to everything else, okay? Scale is just vital, and we're going to look at several examples. Now, come to Japan. Nuclear was a big deal. Fukushima Daiichi happened, and nuclear was shut down. Replaced not so much with coal and oil for dispatchable, but with natural gas, a lot of natural gas coming in. And then hydro stayed and then growing a little bit in the wind and solar in the last several years. So again, an event-driven transition. It's been about a decade in Japan now. Go to Norway, you see oil for transportation and some natural gas and a tremendous amount of hydro. Consumption is largely flat and CO2 emissions are quite low in Norway. Now in India, we see a lot of increase in coal, a lot of increase in oil, and then everything else just getting started. It's a consumption rising continent or country uh, with 1.3 billion people and emissions are rising right along with it. It's a resource driven transition at this point. Germany is fascinating. Electricity story, this is electricity only. Coal was kind of coming down, gas was going up, nuclear was hanging in, renewables were growing. Consumption was rising and emissions were falling. It was a wonderful transition. And then something happened in electricity in Germany. The Great Recession was a dimple. Consumption flattened and emissions flattened. What's going on? Well, Germany got worried about Fukushima. They shut down some nuclear. They got worried about fracking. They shut in some natural gas, the red and the orange. And as a result of that, their policy, their energy vanda, the energy, reduced nuclear natural gas when you do that, the emissions flattened. They were coming down and they flattened for a decade. And our new Secretary of Energy said just last week in her first major talk, she said, Germany, we need to follow. They've reduced emissions by 40% since, since 1990. So I started at 1990. They have, but all the work was done by 2009. The last decade, it's been flat. In fact, policy ran counter to its own intentions. Okay, and, the, and in the last two years, consumption is down, good for them, efficiencies and other things, and CO2 is starting to come down again, but not because necessarily of policy. So the intentions were good. These guys had good intentions. They're putting in posts to keep people from parking next to the building. They forgot where they parked. And I'm sure you as legislators have never put in policies <laughs> that you didn't want to remove. You know, it's tough to remove these posts, but we've got to look at outcomes. Intentions and outcomes, you gotta look at the outcomes. Is it working to accomplish what we hope? Now in France, there was a fascinating transition. Oil was rising in the 60s and then down a lot because they chose what? They chose nuclear, everything else just a little bit. So this is a policy driven transition in France and emissions of CO2 have been flat and are coming down. France don't close nuclear, don't succumb to pressure. 
Nuclear is dense with no emissions. You've already built it. A lot of the world who is emerging needs to follow France in this kind of policy. And here's China, coal, massive coal. All the rest of the energy, this isn't just electricity. All the rest of the energy combined in China is not as much as their coal consumption, okay? Now, there's the CO2 emissions, predictably. Resource driven for a while, then policy. China chose and continues to choose coal. Their five-year plan just came out a couple of weeks ago. They're continuing to choose coal. Now, if I compare Norway to China, here's China's mix, and here's Norway. Remember Norway? Hydro, why can't, why can't China do that? Well, let's scale them the same. Whoa, where'd Norway go? I mean, China produces more solar, which is their least amount of energy form, more solar than all of Norway combines energy. Scale matters. You're talking about seven, eight million people versus 1.3 to 4 billion people, and they're emerging. Let's compare China to India, two countries with almost the same population now. And look at the energy mix. It's almost identical. India and China's energy mix. But the one thing that's different is the amount. India is consuming less than a third the amount of energy that China is today. I'm going to slide India to the left 25 years. There it goes. Look, it's identical to China, essentially. And it's going to pass China in population. What India does matters. Is it going to follow China in the coal world or not? What are its options? Natural gas, nuclear for baseload, some hydro a little bit, and growing the renewables. And here's the US electricity transition. Coal was rising some, natural gas was growing, nuclear was growing, and renewables were getting started. This was a pretty interesting mix. Our emissions in this time frame had flattened from about 97 to 07. Now something happened, the Great Recession was a dimple. Consumption flat and emissions down. Consumption flat, emissions down, how did that happen? Well, we started replacing coal with natural gas. Thank you, hydraulic fracturing. Thank you, Marcellus Shale, okay? It made it cheap, replaced coal. And then state policies for renewable, this mix changed a lot, even though our consumption is still there and emissions are coming down. It's mostly a resource-driven transition. In fact, our emissions reductions, our emission reductions from, from the proposed 2015, that's when Paris happened, Clean Power Plan, we met, it was for 2030. <clears throat> we had a 32% reduction by 2030. We met those in 2020, a decade ahead of schedule. In fact, we, let me say that again, we met our Clean Power Plan emissions goals a decade early without the Clean Power Plan. A lot happened in there, but you can thank renewables in the states and the policies, and you can thank hydraulic fracturing, making coal cheap, or making gas cheap and replacing coal. What else did fracking do? Well, production of oil in the United States was coming down and imports were going up, up, up. And this is just over a decade ago. We were exporting nothing. And then hydraulic fracturing, again, massive increase from double the production of oil in the United States, imports way down, and we actually were exporting some oil. We'll see what happens here in 2020 and 2021. So I've got a team that's been studying these shale basins for about a dozen years now, the most rigorous public studies. And this is the results of that in a slide or two. These are the number of wells drilled in each basin. And this is our base case, the number of wells that could be drilled in each basin. We'll start with natural gas. The big red circle, that's the resource in place. That's how much gas is in the, in the tank down there. The little circle is what's been produced so far by all of those wells. Same scale, the Fayetteville gas, the Haynesville gas, and here comes the Marcellus. I mean, look at the scale in the Marcellus, all right? And here's what's been produced out of the Marcellus, technically recoverable with today's technology. There's also a lot of gas in West Texas. It's associated with the oil. We've been flaring it for a while, and I've been pounding on the industry to stop and finally getting some laws in place and finally getting permission to build the pipelines, which some environmental groups uh, opposed. They couldn't even build the pipelines. So it's this weird mix in that radical middle. But there's your gas. And, and, and because of that, we've seen LNG exports go from importing to big time LNG exports. And look what COVID did, but it's right back where it was already, okay? LNG exports. And that's a lot of jobs. That's a technology transition to produce natural gas from rocks that look like your countertop. You could literally, you know, cut steaks on them or cheese. That's what they look like. So remarkable technology. On the oil side, the Bakken in place and produced, 
Here's the Eagle Ford, which came next. And then West Texas came along, the Midland Basin and the Delaware Basin, big. They're like the Marcellus for oil, big, big numbers. Now, if you look at those wells drilled against what our base case said could be drilled, it's about a third of the wells in the Barnett, 40% in the Haynesville, almost two thirds have been drilled in the Fayetteville, only a quarter in the Marcellus. On the oil side, two thirds in the Bakken, about 40% in the Eagle Ford, just getting started in West Texas, okay? So overall, about a quarter of the wells just over have been drilled that our base case says could be drilled in these big shale basins, depending on how things go. When you recover less than 5% of the gas so far and 8% of the technically recoverable, this is not total, technically recoverable, less than five and 8%, that's a huge resource still left in place in the, in the United States. So let's go global. Global electricity, generation, mostly coal, some oil, a lot of natural gas, nuclear, hydro, and the renewables, solar, wind, and others. The Great Recession didn't have much of an impact on that, did it? Well, the rate is 270% growth since 1985, tremendous growth in electricity. Only natural gas and then the combination of renewables, which weren't around much in 85, have grown faster than the global demand for electricity, natural gas and renewables. Now, if you look at coal out of that electricity mix, coal's been coming down North America and Europe a lot. Where is it going up? Whoa, Asia. The rest of the world doesn't use much coal at all. Remarkable. It's basically coal is an Asian story today. I lay natural gas on top of that at the same scale. Look at the right. Natural gas is on all continents and growing everywhere except in Europe is kind of flat. In fact, the gas to coal ratio has gone from 38% to approaching two thirds now, 62% gas to coal ratio globally for power generation. Now, if I come back to total electricity and, I, and you see the growth rates here, I'm going to lay solar and wind on top of that. The growth rate for solar and wind is exponential still. It's growing tremendously. Your kids will learn that in school. It's, 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 it's completely factual. Now, we got to make that a little bit more factually complete. The rate is growing very fast, but what about the actual generation? Remember, it's right here in the data. It took 15 years of developing the best sun and the wind first. We always develop the best resources first to develop that much generation, not capacity, actual generation. In that same 15 year period, the demand for electricity grew 8,400 terawatt hours. The demand grew and solar and wind satisfied about 25% of that demand growth. The rest still has to be generated and it met about a quarter of the growth. So scale is really important here. We've got to always continue to recognize those challenges. By country, China and the US consume more electricity and here's the rest of the countries. Here's 2018 data, China kept growing a lot and India passed Russia and Japan. Who's missing? Number three, it turns out it's the tech sector. Technology consumes more electricity than any nation on earth, except for China and the US. Look around, you know, everybody's on these gadgets. I took this at my daughter's, our youngest soccer game a few years ago. We were all diligently watching the game. The pets are on them. I mean, look, there's four big sectors of technology data centers, consumer devices, production of ICT networks. Here we are today, and this is one forecast. It probably won't be that much, but it's possible. That's the electricity consumption from technology. How much ele electricity do we generate from solar and wind today? Total in the world, here it is. It's not quite as much as tech consumes. So when you're reading about carbon neutral and you start reading the details that companies big tech companies leading at others are going to go carbon neutral by buying offsets from where? You, there's not enough solar and wind to go around just to satisfy the, the technology sector, much less the rest of the industrial world. So we've got to do other things to begin to reduce emissions. And this cloud, it's a big deal. I mean, it's allowing us to do this. In the rich world, we can do this. We can adapt. But it produces a lot of emissions. No wonder they called it a cloud. They probably wish they could change the name. And now we come to global energy. Here's a map of the world's population, color-coded. Every color about 1.1 billion. We are not evenly distributed. The Western hemisphere about 1.1 billion. Look at the density of people. Here's our energy mix. This is a this is a important figure. Globally, 60% coal and oil still, and 3% solar and wind globally. Now North America has flattened in demand and we're changing our mix. So we're down to 49% coal and oil 
and 4% solar and wind growing. Europe has flattened and coming down a little bit. It's 50% coal and oil, and it's now 7% solar and wind. Russia had some issues, but it's starting to grow in demand again. It's mostly natural gas. A little bit of coal, some oil, 36% total, a lot of natural gas and no solar and wind yet, pretty low latitudes. Latin America is growing, flattened a little bit with economic challenges, but it'll get back on track. And again, not any coal, but a lot of oil, 40%, 7%, and 3% solar and wind. Africa is growing steeply. 1.1 billion people are just starting to get access to energy. And it's mostly coal and oil, 64% and 2% solar and wind. The Middle East won't surprise you, growing steeply in demand, it's all oil and gas. There's one nuclear reactor now, a little bit of solar, no coal, mostly oil, natural gas, and no solar and wind yet. And finally, Southeast Asia, 4 billion people, half the world's population growing in energy demand, and they get 75% of their energy, total energy from coal and oil still, and 3% from solar and wind. I'm going to shrink and grow these to be proportional to demand. Look at the population. This is how much is consumed in each sector. It's not electricity, total energy. Half the world is getting half their energy from coal and another quarter from oil today and growing in those areas. So you understand this graph now. When you go from 65 to today, you understand the transitions in the mix. Policy drove coal in Asia. Policy is driving renewables in the developed world. An event, you know, the Great Recession, not much of an effect. Mostly resources driving. Now we've had a COVID event too. And what's that going to have? What's, what's it going to cause? Well, I'm just going to look at one graph, which have thousands here. But world oil got hit hard by COVID. We shut in the global economy. Consumption plummeted. It's been coming back quite steeply. World production of oil lagged that. It takes a while to shut down rigs to lay off people, 100,000 people lost their jobs. Those are big jobs and they are tough to replace globally. So when production lag, now look what's coming back. Demand is back up, production is lagging that. And the forecast says it'll be about a year more, not much more, we're right back where we were. So when production lags, consumption price goes up and you're seeing that pressure, fundamental, fundamentals, economics, price is increasing. COVID-19 is going to change some behaviors in the developed nations. It's changing ours, but it's really not going to have a lasting impact on the global economy or the energy mix. It's the same infrastructure coming in as going out. And you saw the impact that the Great Recession had. It's mostly a dimple. And I'm just going to be glad to get out of 2020 and COVID personally. Uh, and I think most of you are as well. What else is growing? The world's population. We are headed toward 11 billion people. Who consumes energy? We do. This is correlation causation. So you'll hear the world that could be wind and waves and sun, wind, water, and solar if it was just for policy. And I know a lot of you think hard about that, but by when? Here's a model out to 2065 that goes 98% renewable. Some are saying 2040. I mean, you gotta look at that carefully and ask yourself how that looks globally. How about 75%, maybe 50%, even 25%. Now that might be called business as usual. Let's look at this exact graph right here in units. It's a pretty low demand growth and a business as usual case. But is it? It certainly looks like it, but let's, let's take the exact same data and plot them as a percentage of the global mix. Here they are. So now I'm going from 1965 to 2065. I cut coal and oil in half, double natural gas and nuclear, Renewables go up 400%, fourfold, 25% growth, okay? Or 25% renewables now out here. That's a fourfold growth. The right side of that graph looks nothing like the left side. It's a very different mix and a very different CO2 mix. It's a carbon to hydrocarbon to methane to uranium and thorium transition. It's been happening and it is happening. Some policy perturbs things in coal. It's gonna take policy for solar and wind but it's a resource driven play globally for the most part. And if I look by region, North America and Europe have been flat for almost four decades now in our consumption. Asia has gone way up and the rest of the world is just getting started. They're poor, emerging and developing. They don't use much energy yet. 
Here's the CO2 emissions by region, and it shouldn't shock you now. North America and Europe were flat and are coming down our emissions. You know, pat ourselves on the back. We could do better. Look at Asia. Bad Asia. Asia emits more CO2 than the rest of the world combined now. Is it bad Asia? I mean, why is this? Well, this graph shows that red dashed line. If you're above it, you consume more stuff than you produce. And if you're below it, you produce more than you consume. The United States makes about 5 billion tons of CO2 every year, human CO2. We consume more stuff than we produce. China makes 10 billion tons, twice ours, produce more than they consume. In fact, the non-rich countries, the non-OECDs in blue, mostly produce more than they consume. And the rich countries, the OECDs, mostly consume more than we produce. And so what's happening? We are asking emerging and developing economies to make our stuff. We move manufacturing overseas, haven't we? And as a result of that, on a per product basis, the emissions are higher in developing economies because the regulations are less. So we are essentially saying emit the CO2 for us and we'll buy offsets through products. We'll call that zero emissions. How many atmospheres are there in the world? There's one, there's just one global atmosphere. And this is not addressing climate change. Moving emissions, if that's your state plan, if that's your corporate plan to buy offsets or your country's plan, it isn't helping, okay? You actually have to do something with the CO2. Natural gas replacing coal, natural gas with carbon capture and storage, nuclear, no emissions, coal with carbon capture, geothermal and hydro if you have them, centralized wind, no emissions, distributed renewables, a billion people without any energy today. This is the only way to get energy to them, okay? These are the big wedges to reduce carbon dioxide, plus efficiency and conservation, doing less with more. So these electric vehicles, it's important. I didn't put them on the list, why? Well, here's the, here's the electric vehicle growth. And again, it's growing exponentially. We made 7 million last year, but that's still only a few percent of the total vehicles made in the world. And the light blue and dark blue is China. And then you see other parts of Asia. Half the world's electric vehicles are essentially being made in China. Where does China get its electricity from coal? Okay, so charging with coal isn't clean in terms of emissions. It, it, it kind of on a funny scale reminds me of this. This is an electric vehicle. It's a Beamer, it's a license plate, it says electrons, it's charging an electric pump. And what's generating the electricity? Diesel. Those are diesel generators. You can't make this up. You know, this is, this is interesting, but it isn't really helping. There's a, that's a, that's CO2 right there. Okay. That's that little stack. So what does China do? You know, what can Asia do? Well, here's one big thing. This is coal emissions against natural gas emissions, not for electricity, for everything. It's a cross plot going back to 1965. China has been coal, 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 and just getting started with natural gas. But the coal to gas ratio in China is almost 12x. The rest of Asia is just over 3x coal to gas. The United States is 0.6x. Now we were going gas and then we went coal under Jimmy Carter when the embargo happened, it was seemed coal was secure. Fracking has pushed it back toward shale and gas. So our coal to gas is 0.6x. What if China could go from 12x to 0.6x? How much CO2 would that reduce? Just not with, C not with carbon capture, just by changing fuels. It turns out it would take almost 2 billion tons a year of CO2 out of the atmospheric emissions. 2 billion tons. And if the rest of Asia did that, it's another 1 billion. The combination is almost 3 billion tons from Asia going just from coal to gas, or perhaps they can go coal to nuclear, or gas and nuclear, or hydro if they have it, some dispatchable baseload. Remarkable amount. That's, that's 10 to 15% of global emissions right there a huge piece that China could work on. But nonetheless, people don't like natural gas. I took this picture in Aspen. You eat outside with under these things that keep you warm at night. You heat the atmosphere directly and we don't like global warming. You know, this is a propane tank and we need to kind of remember to remind ourselves what we're using. So I come back here and start to wrap it up. Energy, the environment, the economy, this radical middle. It feels like it's shrinking to me sometimes and maybe you too. 
We don't do what we're doing right now. We don't have bipartisan bicameral meetings to talk about these issues. We don't agree to entertain thoughts without accepting, but at least to entertain them. And I'm so thankful that we're doing this because we're going to grow the radical middle. We're going to ask ourselves, how do we reduce impacts of, of all forms of energy on the atmosphere, air, land, and water? They have different impacts, but we have to treat the whole environment and we can do that. How do we end energy poverty globally? It matters to all of us and build a global economy. How do we make energy affordable, reliable, and available? Those three big things. And that's equitable and sustainable energy. And it requires this nonpartisan energy education. It requires critical thinking. Here's the world at night, composite satellite image. The lights are on in places. Here's our energy mix. You've seen this and I'm gonna shrink it to be proportional consumption. Now you know where the lights are on and you know why have energy. And if we were to take out coal and oil and natural gas and nuclear, remove it all, 90% of the world's energy, first of all, we're not going to do that. The world isn't going to do that. But it wouldn't necessarily even be a good thing. Removing 90% of the energy, let's just darken the lights by 90%. I mean, really, how does that look to you? To me, it looks like our past, not the future of the emerging economies and the developing economies. They need... The, they have to address hunger and clothing and shelter. Energy does that, clean water, education, lights in school and healthcare, vaccines and refrigeration for medicines. Women go for the water. They're cooking indoors with wood and biomass. They don't get to go to schools when the male counterparts do in emerging economies at times. Migration and immigration away from autocracies where they don't have freedom of choice, population, Growth is tied directly to education. I mean, very tightly tied to education and energy. Environmental investment, the ability to take energy, the economy, and invest in that environment, and then to mitigate and adapt climate change. You bring all these things together, and that begins to change the world. In Pennsylvania, you have all these things, and you have the tools, and Pennsylvania can lead. You can begin to change the world. So thank you for your attention. And if there's time, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to try to address some questions. My day job is at the Bureau and the Jackson School. We, we work on all three of these pillars globally. And of course, my night job where I dump my money and my time is making films, energy education. So go there, go to switchon.org and check it out if you can. And lots of stuff there um, that we are happy to share with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tinker. Uh, I don't know, we, uh, of those uh, questions that we sent to you, uh, uh, is there a, a one or two of them that uh, you thought were uh, uh, unusual or you would like to address? <laughs> oh boy, they were, all, they were all good. And I hope I addressed quite a few of them um, when I was, when, throughout my talk. Uh, you know, I don't know if anything came through the chat. It doesn't matter to me. I am not elected. <laughs> so, so I'm happy to you know, share what's on my mind and, and be as completely factual as I can be. So if there's anything in the chat that came through, I'm happy to address those if there's time and otherwise. Uh, uh, I think that you did a really good job of uh, uh, answering a, a lot of them. I had read them uh, over yesterday and uh, I think that you, you really answered a lot. I'm sure though that your presentation, we could go on for hours and mm -hmm. with questions, but uh, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, all the uh, people that uh, uh, were online and uh, uh, participated today will take the time to uh, it, give us some feedback, what you think about uh, the program, what we've done. Uh, maybe we can follow this up with uh, some other uh, bipartisan, bicameral uh, events like this, uh, uh, especially uh, talking about energy. And uh, as uh, Dr. Tinker uh, indicated, uh, I am a huge uh, uh, advocate uh, for Pennsylvania energy and uh, the Pennsylvania resources that we have here. Uh, and uh, I think that we need to uh, be proud of what we have and how we use them. So with that, uh, I'm going to once again, 
thank Dr. Scott Tinker. I know we ran over the time that uh, we had with him a little bit, but uh, I think it was well worth it. I really enjoyed it. Once again, uh, uh, if you have any feedback uh, in my office, I would really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Tinker, uh, thank you. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure that you will be hearing from Pennsylvania again. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for what you do and I'd be happy to engage. Thank you. Thanks to everybody once again for attending.